Hello my friends, Evolutionary Energy Arch family. So guys, um, thanks to a subscriber that shared on my Facebook, got me thinking, shared a link, got me thinking down a, a different track, and things um, really, really come together so nicely. We're getting such an interesting picture that's emerging on what we go through, what the planet goes through, what we all go through on a regular basis and you know what um yeah you know the more you look into it the more you know we have not been taught the way things really are but it's all being revealed now and this is a story that's uh repeated through numerous links which is really interesting and so damage from a solar storm depends on the rocks that lie beneath your feet so in effect, you know, are you walking on potentially live wires right now uh, that are waiting to interact with whatever comes our way in the future uh, through a CME, coronal mass ejection, you know, a super flare, supernova, nova, uh, through interaction, electromagnetic reaction, perhaps with Nibiru, Planet X, Nemesis system, uh, or whatever may come. Part of the equation is really what is under your feet right now. And so our sun is a restless star. Even when it's particularly active, solar flares can occur. When a flare reaches the Earth, we can see spectacular displays of auroras. However, especially strong outbursts can lead to more serious consequences, like geomagnetic storms that damage the Earth's magnetic field, which can disrupt the planet's electrical grid infrastructure. And as it turns out, your city's ability to withstand a powerful geomagnetic storm may depend upon the rocks that lie beneath your feet. And perhaps it's even more than just the grid. When we look at some of the evidence uh, as to what electricity and arcing can do. So a recent study conducted by the USGS analyzed how different types of rocks interact with geomagnetic storms in the northeastern United States. I wish it uh, included more than just one little locale, although that is a big locale when you're talking people. Um, this is fascinating. The work shows that potential damage to power grids may increase or decrease depending on the type of rocks in the region. For people living in New England, for example, the risk of severe damage from geomagnetic storms is higher. And for those who live in the Mid-Atlantic coastal plain, the risk is much lower. Powerful solar storms should be taken seriously. When there is a flare on the sun, the charged particles in the upper atmosphere disrupt radio signals. And if the flare is strong enough, radio communications used by airlines and satellite navigation networks malfunction or completely stops functioning. 30 minutes later, a huge stream of electrons and protons moving at almost the speed of light reaches Earth. This attack damages electronic circuits and satellites and astronauts who are outside of the Earth's magnetic bubble may get a potentially dangerous dose of radiation. Then, 18 hours to several days after the start of the event, a huge plasma cloud known as coronal mass ejection crashes into the Earth's magnetic bubble at about 3,000 kilometers a second. This process is capable of causing major disturbances in our planet's magnetic field, known as geomagnetic storms. Powerful storms can damage power grids. This can cause large-scale power outages. For example, a geomagnetic storm in 1989 caused power outages throughout Quebec. During the Vietnam War, extreme space weather triggered the explosion of several sea mines along the coast of Vietnam. And, uh, you know, that should be a <laughs> wake-up call right then and there as to what can happen with the electrical activity that, that can be brought about through these storms. The geological composition of the terrain can have a huge impact on the potential damage from the storm. For example, the north of Scotland has plenty of resistive rocks, which means that power grids are exposed to dangerously strong geoelectric fields. The south of England, on the contrary, has sedimentary rocks that do not pose a high risk. 
The situation is even more difficult on the coast as there are both resistive sand and conductive seawater. The risk of damage from a geomagnetic storm varies from region to region with some electrically resistive rocks raising the level of regional geoelectric hazard by a factor of 100. For example, the huge amounts of volcanic and metamorphic rocks in the Appalachian Mountains indicate that power grids will be severely damaged next time the sun directs its anger at us. So this is repeated basically in a few more articles and a couple of these have a little bit more info and some have a little bit less. Um, but it, it's really interesting you know, when you think about it and the times that we live in here you know, look at all the clues we're getting, you know, Department of Homeland Security, prepare for six months without the grid. Honestly, it'd probably be years, maybe it'd be decades, who knows uh, how long it would be, depending on the severity of what comes. And, you know, if, if you're familiar with, and we're going to get into the Thunderbolts project, also we'll talk about Douglas Vote and Diehold Foundation, the idea of a, a nova, not the sun going supernova, but the sun emitting a nova on a regular basis. And all the science is coming out now. And with the science coming out now, that makes me feel we're pretty damn close because I don't think they'd want to panic people. Um, they don't want to give people enough time to panic. You know, so those of us that are interested in this stuff, we're learning, we're starting to understand. Um, we're starting to understand the bigger picture and what we are facing. Uh, the vast majority of the population, you know, as we know, they view them as zombies. That's what they view them as, zombies. They, they're, they're just not awake. They're comatose, walking around in, in a stupor, and have no clue of what's coming our way. But they've been dribbling this info out to us, and at a pretty good rate right now. And uh, there's a lot of pieces to the puzzle, as it talks about here. Uh, to what's going on, what to expect, and just how devastating this can be. And actually, you know, what type of effects it could have on the planet in general. Uh, we see that the sun is in a very interesting cycle. And obviously, they're trying to cover up a lot of things up in the sky. And it does feel like it's very multifaceted. Very, very multifaceted. You know, we've talked about the Carrington event. We've talked about how our society today is is really in so many ways in much worse shape than we were in 1859 or than we would be say going back two to three thousand years ago and dealing with this because we are so you know we are so dependent on our technology that most people have no clue about self-sustainability most people if they can't go grab it off the shelf they're going to start to starve or they're going to try to take it off of, you know, somebody else's shelf or out of somebody else's house. As we, you know, can see that society can deteriorate pretty fast when people panic. And again, this is why it's so imperative to get the word out to people about what is underway already and, and what's coming. And uh, this is pretty pretty interesting stuff when you get down to it so let's go back over here and we talked about this before so we're talking about we're talking about different layers of rock and we're talking about big events big CMEs and uh, EMPs are another another risk as well and there's there's many things we're facing here so Earth's magnetic cage usually does a commendable job of shielding us from the sun's showers of plasma that sprinkle our planet, even managing to handle occasional vigorous downpours that strike us from time to time. Every roof has its limits, though, and our magnetosphere is no exception. And the fact is, we're in a pole reversal, a magnetic pole reversal, so it's declining at the fastest rate in our times and in many, many, many generations. And, uh, you know, it is way, way overdue for a full reversal. Way overdue. So there's a lot of things we're facing. This, this is a confluence of so many different things coming in at the same time. So as its gutters 
overflow with rivers of protons and electrons ejected from the sun at nearly, nearly light speed. Intense fields are generated, driving electrical currents far below. Sometimes the effects are relatively minor, but not always. Recently declassified naval documents, as we said, describe the peculiar detonations of dozens of sea mines off the Vietnam coast in 1972, since attributed to solar activity sparking their magnetic sensors. Think about all the things that could be lit up, right, with, you know, a, a big frequency, a big event of, of a large amplitude. And that is more than likely something that is heading our way. Think about that. You remember New York City? Remember, remember the blue light that lit up all around there, up in New York? And remember that it was just a transformer going off. What set the transformer? Then there was one down in the south. I believe it was in Louisiana, uh, if I remember right that blew up and, and went off. We're going to be seeing these events on a regular basis. You're going to see transformers blowing and you might see other things blowing as too. So be aware of your surroundings. So there have been hints of far more damaging con consequences too. While technology was bare, barely in its infancy in 1859, a powerful coronal mass ejection overwhelmed telegraph wires shocking operators and sparking fires in what's famously known as the Carrington event. More than a century on, our world is cocooned in a fine web of wire that transports power and telecommunication signals into every corner of the globe. That network is especially vulnerable to solar storms. If one strikes, that's powerful enough. Those thin stretches of metal aren't the only materials that can transmit currents of electricity either. So long as it's made, of the right kinds of minerals, voltages can be induced in the planet's crust. Waterlogged slabs of porous sedimentary rock are capable of conduction, for example. So if you think that means you're safer moving to a city perched on top of a giant insulator like a field of granite, think again. Under the right conditions, they could help short-circuit power grids running across their surface. The interface between the ocean's waters and the insulation of a sandy shoreline also poses risks of currents diverting and building, putting nearby power grids at greater risk. Depending on how a region's geological jigsaw puzzle locks together, sections of technological infrastructure can either be supercharged with current during periods of intense solar activity or relatively protected from harm. South England has enough sedimentary rock to weather a, a solar storm with relatively ease compared with the electrically resistant Appalachians in North America, which could easily blow out any grid crossing the mountain range. Armed with details of good geoelectrical survey, authorities would be better prepared to plan for the powerful solar storms that are bound to hit because they are coming, and when a big one strikes, it won't be pretty. And so this is out of space weather. And um, it's so fascinating when you look at all the puzzle pieces. Uh, it does look like we go through these cycles at regular intervals. And we talked about uh, some of this in the last couple days. Ice cores reveal massive geomagnetic storms hit the Earth about 2,600 and 1,300 years ago. We start seeing some numbers repeat themselves. Um, and again, now this, this one right here, this is the proceedings for the National Academy of Sciences. And this is again, we're talking about evidence for an extreme solar proton event around 2610 before now, basically about 660 BC, thereabouts. So remember that time frame, 660 BC, we have President Trump's executive order on EMP preparedness. Why it's huge. You know, we were talking about this again. The Congressional EMP Commission. Why? Why have they done this? Why are they having all these drills for this? What's going on here? Why are they, you know, making all these bunkers and huge cities underground and everything? And, you know, they. I'm sure they know where they're... Um, where their deep underground military bases are located, what type of rocks are there, because 
you know, again, this is another factor. And it's more than just simply knocking out the grid, as we're going to get into. So enormous solar storm that hit Earth 2,600 years ago could be the biggest ever detected. Again, you know, this has taken us roughly into that, you know, 500, 600, 660 BC area. And this is the US uh, GS report. And this is a uh, space weather talking about the amplitude and polarization across the northern northeastern United States. I'll have all these links so you guys could delve in dig and dig for yourself a little bit deeper. And this is a science alert talking about those USC mines that were actually triggered by, you know, this CME coming in, getting mines to blow up. How many things do we have in this world that could be triggered? if we get one of these big events. And then this is out of open geology, just to get you guys um, a little bit more comfortable with the terms, the different types of rocks, metamorphic rocks, and uh, how these things come about as far as the rock cycle, understanding how they come about. And so you can maybe do a little analysis for yourself and understand where you are. And in the future, I'll do a, a video on that again as I get more information and go in there. And again, this is one more thing we can put into the picture about, you know, safe zones or just knowing the risks, you know, involved with where you are living. So we were taught that the Grand Canyon, this massive thing was basically carved away by this, this little river here, this little river right here, that that did all this over a period of millions of years, millions and millions of years. So this is out of the Thunderbolts uh, dot info, and this is all uh, electric universe theory. And so the thought is that it didn't happen because of that river. Not at all. It's more about what's going on. When you have planetary bodies coming by close to each other, causing an electromagnetic response between them, and so this is really fascinating stuff. And it, it talks about Birkeland currents and discharges, et cetera, et cetera. Very interesting, interesting thoughts. And so was this instead of being formed over millions of years by slow erosion, was this formed because of plasma? And that's, that's basically what we're talking about here. So it's, it's known from laboratory experiments that if two charged sheaths touch one another, there is an exchange of electrical potential until they re reach equilibrium. And yes, isn't life all about balance? If the current flow is large enough, there will be a visible arc and a flash, otherwise known as a lightning bolt. The planetary scarring hypothesis interprets the laboratory experiments using a scaled up approach. If the smaller charged sheaths interact in a certain way, then the larger planetary plasma spheres will act in a similar fashion, releasing gigantic lightning bolts. Discharges of such a magnitude are capable of stripping rock and gas from a planet with far greater energy than the comparatively puny force of gravity. Since the rim edges of the Grand Canyon are sharp and they do not show much erosion, then an argument could be made for a recent formation. It was recently etched with EDM forces on such a colossal scale in an encounter with another planetary body. The surface biota, soil, and rock, and most of the water was obliterated. A Birkeland current in contact with the Earth might have acted like a rotating auger, drilling deeply into the bedrock, removing the material, and accelerating it upward and away from the point of contact. This effect might be thought of as an electric vacuum, charging the debris in an expanding electric field and then blasting it upward through the power of power of like charge repulsion. EDM effects in machine shops strip uniform layers from the substrate while leaving essentially a vertical wall and a flat new surface. In an interplanetary EDM, the rotating current would tend to lift up sections of strata that would leave a terraced effect and a layered appearance, much like what we see in the Grand Canyon. And so is that actually how this happened? And can you imagine what 
would happen to anybody, uh, anything that was in that area when that happened. The Grand Canyon was created by electricity arcing from Venus and was not eroded by the Colorado River. And if you're familiar with Velikovsky, um, it's, it's another case where, you know, he was thought to be a whack job, you know, by the uh, mainstream. But a lot of what he has, has said, looking at the, the hidden history of the world, of our Earth, uh, has been borne out to be looking more and more logical all the time. And so there is a video here for you guys to check out. Uh, please do check it out. I'll give you the, li the links here as well. And, um, you know, right here it's recommending you start at eight and a half minutes to, to dive straight into the detail. There's no way water flowing could have created all the features of the Grand Canyon as people used to believe. No doubt the C-A-B-A-L doesn't want people to realize the universe is electric as we can start to unravel yet more of their multiple deceptions once that point is established. The author of this presentation, Michael Steinbacher, unfortunately died in July of 2015. But he had studied geological formations in the American Southwest into the field, and he had compared the standard explanations and alternative explanations with what he sees and has noted correspondences and, 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 and anomalies. The context of his study is the physical interpretation of globally occurring themes of ancient legends and arts, the observed properties of plasma behavior in laboratory settings, and a plasma catastrophe cat, cat, <laughs> theory of the recent geological history of the Earth. Probably because I'm so excited because it just feels like so much of this is really making sense and coming together. Um, but again, then it, we do have a lot that we are going to be contending with. So again, uh, he, it's, a, it's a really good, very interesting presentation. Encourage you guys to look through and see what you think of it. And then it just begs the, begs the question about a lot of these events that we were talking about. We were talking yesterday about the three Plinian eruptions over at Mount Popo. And so one of them was in that basically 3,000 years ago period, and the other one was at 2150, and then one at 1100. So this one here, 2150 years ago, that would fit into that same timeline, uh, between 800 and 215 BC. And so we're starting to see that a lot of these events fit into the same timelines. And we talked about this PDF as well, and this was basically talking about the sun going nova and that these events on a sun like ours could basically happen about every two to three thousand years which fits perfectly into basically that 2500 2600 year ago timeline so there again um, all the indications are there and then if we want to look into the sumerian legends you have to ask yourself about 600 years BC again, the same timeline, why did the Anunnaki start to depart the earth? And why did the Anunnaki leave the earth? You know, some think there was one or two that possibly stayed here. Others believe that it's just simply, you know, their chosen offspring, you know, the cabal, oops, I said the C word, you know, the, the I word, the DS, that are, you know, the ones that were originally chosen to be kings from on high because of their bloodlines. But why did they leave at that same time? Did they know about this event? They knew, if, you, if we look at the legends, um, and we look at the flood legend from the Sumerian texts, which is at least a thousand years old, probably even more older than what we have from the Bible, so we know the biblical texts come from the Sumerian texts. And, you know, there, it basically states they knew when the flood was coming. They knew when the glaciers were going to slide on into the ocean and cause this massive flood. And so they all got up and off the planet until it was safe to come back down. They watched from above. They are the watchers, by the way, the Nephilim. I mean, that's what they're called, right? And uh, there's different different words, but it doesn't matter. We're talking about the same beings, the same legends. Um, and so it's interesting that this fits into the same timeline again. So if they knew, and obviously if they're technologically 
more advanced than us, they could probably know about when the big uh, Nova event or the big CME is coming. So they left, and that's why they left. And, you know, there could be other things as well, but that is probably a big point of why they left. And again, it fits into the timeline perfectly again. So they get out of the way and move far enough away that they're not going to be affected by it when it comes. And so here's uh, a look at some of the different types of rock and where they're found. And uh, I would encourage you guys to look into this more and I look forward to your comments. You know, it's, it's in exactly this way that we start uncovering more and more fascinating things that just seem to go together. And uh, I don't know about you guys, but I'm feeling like uh, the picture's getting clearer. Do you guys think that? Or does it still feel very convoluted to you? As always, looking forward to your comments. My friends, thank you for your support. Please do thumbs up, support the channel, subscribe, click the bell, get all the notifications to both Evolutionary Energy Arts and Evolutionary Energy Arts number two. And share, share, share as we wake up people and get them prepared for what is heading our way. And as always, it'll go better the more we can work together and recognize the bigger picture. So stay safe, my friends. God bless and namaste.